Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Testy, the Dean of the University of Washington School of Law, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you this evening to the installation of Professor Bob gummel kiewitz as the UW Law Foundation Professor of Law. I'm so pleased that you can be with us tonight here in William H. Gates Hall. And uh, I noted as uh, we were in the hallway taking pictures that uh, our uh, wonderful alum and namesake of the building, uh, Bill Gates Sr. is with us this evening. So I wanna pay a special welcome to you. And I also told Professor Gommel Kiewitz, who's my good friend, that there's no pressure or anything, but my parents are also here this evening in the back. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I hope you'll all have a chance to say hello to them as well. I, uh, I do greet you very warmly this evening, and uh, these are just the events that I so enjoy. Uh, our faculty in this law school are leaders for the global common good in every respect. And as we continue to advance as the law school, the faculty continue to be our intellectual leaders in, in that regard. And so to have an opportunity to celebrate the fact of their contributions in scholarship and teaching and service and the advancement of this law school is a joyous occasion for us. And so I'm really pleased that you can be with us tonight uh, to join in this special uh, ability to honor Professor Grammel Kiewitz. Um, we also have an occasion tonight to thank the UW Law Foundation. And when I first became the dean here, one of the members of the board told me that the foundation's aim was to be the dean's best friend. And I want to tell you that uh, the foundation has certainly delivered on that in every respect. I know that what it meant when it said that was to be an asset to this law school and to me as the leader of the law school. But I have to say that the members of that foundation have also been the dean's best friend in every personal respect as well. It's just an amazingly dedicated group of our alums. And it's a particular pleasure tonight for me to introduce the president of the UW Law Foundation, Linda Eberson. And Linda is a graduate of this law school from 76, and she is one of Washington's most distinguished family law attorneys. She practices with the firm of Lasher, Hosaffel, Sperry, and Eberson. And I'll note that uh, three of the four of those uh, named persons are uh, our alumni as well, I believe. Um, as I noted, Linda is our leader of our foundation as its president. She has been an incredibly good supporter of this law school in every way, and uh, I am constantly grateful for her wise guidance and uh, dedication to leadership with the foundation. So Linda, let me ask you to please join me and uh, share some remarks about the foundation. Thank you for those kind words, Dean Testy. Uh, I would like to begin with a brief history of the Law School Foundation. Uh, the foundation was formed in 1969, and its bylaws, as many corporate documents, enumerate all of our uh, options and goals in supporting the law school, and it's quite a lengthy list. But as the dean said, uh, and jo as Joe Brotherton, my predecessor in this position for the Law School Foundation, uh, dubbed us, our job is to be the dean's best friend. Uh, and we are honored to have the opportunity to be the dean's best friend by uh, being also uh, creating the UW Law Foundation named Professor of Law established by the board. Uh, its purpose is to further the mission of the University of Washington School of Law uh, and its professors as leaders for the global common good. This fund is used to attract and retain, retrain, retain distinguished faculty at the law school. I'm honored to represent the foundation, and the foundation board is honored to fund uh, the awarded chair to a distinguished professor of law. Uh, we set this up, and it is designed to encourage, enhance, and reward faculty members' scholarly work in recognition of the importance of engaged and committed faculty members. I would like to introduce uh, Professor Calandrillo, who will be speaking about and will introduce uh, Professor Gamal Kiewicz. Uh, Professor Calandrillo joined the University of Washington Law School facu faculty in 2000 and was named the Charles I. Stone Professor of Law in 2009. Prior to teaching, he clerked for Judge Alfred Goodwin on the Ninth Circuit and practiced corporate law at Foster Pepper in Seattle. 
Professor Calandrillo graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he was a John M. Olin Fellow in Law and Economics and a member of the Harvard Journal on Legislation. Please help me welcome Professor Calandrillo. Thank you, uh, Linda Eberson and, and the Washington Law School Foundation. Uh, your service and your contributions uh, to our school has mattered so much. It's been really invaluable to have your support. Uh, it is my honor and privilege today uh, to introduce the man of the hour, Bob gummel -Kywix. Uh He's one of the only uh, faculty members in this school that has a, a harder last name to pronounce and spell than my own, so I'm pretty <laughs> excited about that to have him here. And I was really touched when he asked me to speak and give a few introductory remarks today um, because I think so highly. Uh, of you, and I, I want you to know that. And it's not just for the work that you've uh, done at the law school and what you've meant to this institution, but it's because of his integrity, it's because of his leadership, it's because of how much he cares about our students. Uh, it, it really means a lot to this school and means a lot to me that you're being recognized with this well-deserved honor today. Uh, I want to start off giving a, a few of the basics of uh, Bob's bio, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what I think are the real highlights of, of the man. Um, the basics, if you read the brochure, right, you might think he was a lifelong Northwesterner. Certainly I thought that reading his resume. Uh, that's not true. Bob was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, his dad worked for Alcoa, the aluminum company. Uh, and when Bob was just three years old, his dad was actually asked to go start up a plant in Veracruz, Mexico where he spent some time uh, in his very early years. Uh, his dad was then transferred up to Vancouver, Washington. And I think Bob was around age five at the time. Uh, you might think, okay, that's what started his Northwest career. But, but no, shortly thereafter, his father again was transferred to Suriname in South America. Uh, Bob had to actually show me, he drew me a little picture today about where Suriname is in relation to Brazil. And I actually expanded my geographical knowledge because of this. <laughs> but that's where Bob spent some of his real formative years from a, uh, first grade through third grade, uh, living in uh, Suriname. Um, and this international experience still colors his worldview to this day. Um, I mean, spending his, some of his formative years uh, in poverty-stricken countries, right, both in Mexico and in Suriname. Uh, it wasn't until fourth grade that he moved back to Washington State, to Wenatchee, where he resumed the rest of his, uh, you know, uh, fourth through twelfth grade education. Uh, and that then led him to go to Pacific Lutheran University, uh, where he graduated magna cum laude in 1983. Um, he continued to work through college, by the way, to pay his way through, working as a laborer uh, on odd jobs because it was so important to, to make uh, you know, to have that experience through his collegiate education. Uh, luckily for us, afterwards, he decided to come to the University of Washington School of Law. In 1987, he received his law degree here. He also received a degree at the Jackson School at the same time. Uh, while at the law school, he served as executive uh, editor of the Washington Law Review. Uh, after graduating law school and having a very successful academic career here, uh, he went to the law firm of Preston Gates and Ellis, now K&L Gates, uh, where he represented software developers, got to work on the uh, famous Apple versus Microsoft case, and obviously the work with Microsoft helped transition him into the in-house position as Associate General Counsel there, where he spent a decade from 1991 uh, to 2001 as Associate General Counsel at Microsoft, uh, heading up their licensing team. Uh, it was in 2002 that we convinced him to come and join us again at the University of Washington School of Law, heading up our IP LLM uh, program, which I'll speak more about in a moment and Bob's role in developing that program. Uh, he spent 10 years making it into a national, a leading national intellectual property program. Uh, and he's now the faculty director of the Law, Technology, Technology and Arts Group. Tough enough to pronounce that group. He was also a visitor at Oxford in 2008 to 2009. Uh, and today is our newest endowed pr professor, the Washington Law Foundation Professor of Law. But there are three important themes that I think we need to discuss when we discuss uh, the work that Bob has done, uh, both here and elsewhere. Uh, it was, that means so much to our community. Uh, first is the impact of his scholarship, right? These professorships are often awarded for scholarly impact, and there is no question that Bob meets that, uh, meets that easily. Uh, secondly, I want to spend a fair amount of time discussing uh, his transformational role when it comes to intellectual property education in America, that his role in building our IP program here and the model it's become for other programs across the United States. And thirdly, I want to talk more broadly about the principles of leadership. 
uh, leadership that Bob uh, has running through his veins that we can all uh, you know, look to and act as a model for us, for us all. Um, first, the scholarship, right? These professorships are often awarded to recognize scholarly impact. And Bob has been easily a transformative thinker when it comes to intellectual property licensing, um, transforming an incredible uh, business career at Microsoft, uh, you know, the, the practice of law, uh, as a licensing expert there, the head of their licensing team, into numerous articles on mass market licensing and open source software. I'm sure we're going to learn a lot more about that when Bob gets done with his talk today. I did a quick literature review in preparation for this introduction. Uh, I found no less than 19 separate law review articles that Bob had written. Um, I found at least three books slash treatises uh, and intellectual property licensing, at least 500 citations to his work in at least 100 different places to what he's done. Um, I also did a quick Google search. Uh, you, if you do a Google search on your own name, I don't know how many folks are, will admit that they've ever done that. I did one on his name earlier. Uh, 50 pages of hits, every single hit relevant, before I could find one non-relevant hit. It is very tough to count anybody's pages and not get to an irrelevant hit uh, 50 pages on down the line. But it's not just the quantity of his work. It is the incredible impact that his scholarship has had. Uh, it's really been profound. Um, his 1998 article, uh, The License is the Product, is credited with framing the debate about mass market software licenses. I spoke to um, Scott David, the, the executive director of the Law, Technology, and Arts uh, group yesterday uh, about this. Uh, and he said decades ago, when he first met Bob, and, and certainly by the late 90s, he remembered Bob saying, uh, in the world of software, the contract is the product. The contract is the product. And in saying that, he wasn't trying to downgrade the efforts of the developers, the software engineers and developers, and obviously their technological innovations are, you know, are key to much of the success that we've seen over the last 10, 20 years when it comes to computing. But what he was trying to say was that in the absence of a contract, i.e. a license, uh, there is no business plan. Right? And Bob really was among the first to see uh, the relationship of law and technology and how they work together uh, to create value. Right? Just the product itself does not do it. The license is the product. Uh, he followed that up with how CopyLeft uh, uses license rights to succeed, uh, providing a legal lens through which scholars understood or began to understand the open source software movement. Uh, more recently, maybe five, six, seven years ago, I remember an article of his he wrote uh, entitled General Public License 3.0, Hacking the Free Software Movement's Constitution. Uh, in this piece, he created a simple license alternative to the complex existing models that were out there. He didn't uh, just criticize the models that were out there. He actually provided a model that others could use. So many of us criticize others in our work. Very few of us actually provide solutions. If you look at Congress today, they're very good at criticizing, much less good at actually creating solutions. And today, obviously, the topic of his talk, uh, fostering the business of innovation, which we'll all come to learn uh, a lot about once he gets a chance to stand up here. But it's more than that. It's not just the law review articles. Uh, you know, it's like the Ginsu knife, right? It's not just the knives. You get more. You get at least two case books, right? Uh, licensing intellectual property, a new one on legal protection of software coming out by Aspen. It's not just that. You have an exhaustive treatise on intellectual property software and informational license uh, you know, the significance here is, is Bob's scholarship has this very rare combination of serving three different audiences, and he has stayed on top for all three, right? He's got the law review articles for the academics and for the theorists in this room. He's got the case books for the students of intellectual property law, uh, and he's also got the treatises for the practitioners on the ground actually doing intellectual property licensing. Uh, his scholarship truly walks the talk of combining theory with practice. We talk about that all the time. Bob actually does that. He combines theory with practice, reaching multiple audiences, uh, and he realizes early on, even during his business career, that the, the impact that legal scholarship could have on the world of intellectual property licensing. That's number one. That's scholarly impact. Number two, uh, his role in building up our intellectual property uh, LLM program, now the Law, Technology, and Arts Group, of which he's the faculty director, uh, it is not an overstatement. It's not hyperbole to say he's actually been transformational when it's comes to intellectual property law in the United States of America. 
Uh, when he first asked me to uh, offer these remarks today, uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to talk to Toshiko Takanaka, because I knew she was also heavily involved in the development of our intellectual property program, and I want to talk to her about how it came about and uh, Bob's role in building up our law, technology, and arts group. Um, and of course, Toshiko, as you know, had developed CASREP, the Center for Advanced Study and Research on Intellectual Property. I memorized that, so everybody remembers <laughs> CASREP. Nobody can tell you what it stands for. Uh, and it had become such a success that in the early 2000s, uh, there was discussion of starting a, an actual intellectual property LLM program, really expanding our reach in intellectual property law. Uh, and she had discussions at the time with then Dean Joe Knight, uh, then Associate Dean Pat Cusler, who's again our Associate Dean, uh, about creating the very first intellectual property LLM program on the West Coast. There was maybe only 10 or so such problem programs in all of the United States, none on the West Coast. And this was a risky and new venture. And the first thing that was decided upon was that we needed to recruit a faculty director who could lead and build this program from scratch. Uh, fortunately for us, she knew Bob from his great work at Microsoft. Uh, he had also already served as an adjunct professor at the University of Washington School of Law, uh, teaching legal protection for software. By the way, what better professor for legal protection for software than the Associate General Counsel at Microsoft? Uh, <laughs> And fortunately for us, unfortunately for Microsoft, we persuaded Bob to come and join the University of Washington School of Law uh, because of his incredible leadership and management tech, uh, skills. Uh, and he set out to create a blueprint for what IP LLM, Advanced Intellectual Property Education uh, in America, has become. Again, balancing the theory with the practice. Uh, creating uh, the IP core, this boot camp of intellectual property courses, uh, right, combining an intensive review of patent law, copyright law, trademark law, trade secret. And around that, he's built maybe 15 to 20 other advanced complementary uh, intellectual property courses, hiring some of the best uh, intellectual property lawyers in the country to teach as part-time lecturers here, as well as many of our own faculty to teach some of these courses. Um, it's really been an incredible success from the initial uh, I mentioned back, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, there was 10 programs across the United States. Now there's something like 40 programs across the United States, many of which have modeled their, their programs on our own. Uh, we've graduated 30 to 35 new IPLM students per year, uh, over 300 graduates from this program in the last decade. What an incredible success, involving many faculty members. I mentioned Toshiko, but also um, Sidney Nave, Jane Wynn, Anita Ramasastri, Sean O'Connor, who uh, was the director of the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic, Zahra Saeed, and many, many more. Um, I want to speak briefly about a quote that uh, Signe Nave gave me uh, about her experience with Bob, uh, not just working with him as a teacher in the intellectual property program, but she was also a student. Uh, and she said to me, don't be fooled by Bob's goofiness. He's truly a brilliant man. <laughs> Only... <laughs> Only a brilliant person can take concepts that are complex in nature and make them seem so simple. That is Bob's talent. That and moot court and teaching basketball. She also added that Bob's favorite thing to say is that there's no better time and there's no better place to study intellectual property. Uh, and, the, and she's right about that. But the reason she's right about that is because Bob made it so. Right? His leadership made it so. Um, and his transformative work on our intellectual property program uh, is also uh, manifested itself in leading scholarship. In addition to all the articles I've previously mentioned, in 2011 he published Towards a Better Model for Educating Future Leaders in Intellectual Property Law. Right? Again, looking at all of the challenges in IP education, all the opportunities for advancement, and the successes uh, that, that our program has created. And I'll tell you that many others around the country operating similar programs, many have been Threatened. Others have simply copied uh, many of Bob's great ideas. They say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Uh, and at the core of all of it is his critical analysis of what intellectual property education uh, should be like. He's transformed the University of Washington School of Law into a leading institutional thinker on that account. Again, bringing together practical and theoretical learning. My last main theme is that of leadership. Uh, obviously, I've already been discussing leadership throughout, obviously, with respect to the scholarly impact of his articles and his work on building our intellectual property program in the Law, Technology, and Arts group. But it's worth addressing the, the, the notion of leadership more directly as well. Uh, he's what I like to call a quiet leader. Uh, he's not the dean, right? He's not the associate dean. Uh, he leads under the radar. He leads 
by example. Uh, in addition to his role, obviously, in building the IP program, um, he served as faculty advisor to the Washington Law Review. He's still doing that. He's serving as faculty advisor to the Washington Journal of Law, Technology, and Arts, the former Scheidler Journal. Uh, in that capacity, he's convened all of the editor-in-chiefs of all of our journals to, to come together to help facilitate collaboration between all of our journals. You'll note the quote in your brochure there from Kathleen Kirkland, former Washington Law Review editor-in-chief, who describes Bob as the quote, Zen master of leadership. Uh, and I thought about this quote. It's incredibly accurate because he is this quiet, modest, under the radar leader. He doesn't try to impose his will. He doesn't try to solve your problems for you. He listens to all the interest groups and all the folks involved. He understands their concerns. He helps facilitate uh, them reaching solutions. Right? And that's what real leadership is all about. It's not telling people this is what you need to do. It's about understanding concerns, leading by example, leading quietly, and helping people come up with mutually beneficial resolutions uh, to problems. He's also chaired multiple committees here at the law school and at the university more broadly. I, uh, he, right now he's chairing a committee uh, that's including a strategic overview of all of our law journals. I sit on this committee with him and I marvel in his leadership on this committee as well. Because again, he's balancing interest groups that have you know very deeply held stakes and interests in the process and want specific outcomes and he listens carefully he leads quietly he doesn't impose solutions he helps people figure out solutions that will lead us all forward and all of this, by the way, again, is you know, at the university here, either at the law school or at the university level. He's also an absolutely incredible leader outside the University of Washington. In fact, his leadership there is even more impressive. And I imagine many of you, until you read the bio today, uh, may not have known about a lot of his leadership outside the university. He was on the board of regents at Pacific uh, Lutheran University for 10 years. He chaired the board of regents at Pacific Lutheran University from 2006 through 2010, uh, receiving the President's Medal from the university in 2010 in recognition of, his scholar, of recognition of his leadership and his service. He also earned the Distinguished Alumni Award in 2012 from Pacific Lutheran University. He served on the board of directors of no less than three major organizations, including Independent Colleges of Washington, Camp Fire USA, and also the Rural Development Institute, uh, now Landessa. Beyond that, he's coached his kids' basketball teams, soccer teams, softball teams, uh, now his daughter's high school debate team. That is no easy task, I can tell you from some experience of my own. But it's this incredible community engagement, uh, all centered around giving back uh, that shows what a leader he is by example. His leadership, his thoughtfulness, his modesty, it's made him such a success in his teaching and his scholarship and his service to this institution and to the broader community. Uh, and really it makes him a model for our students, for our staff, and for our faculty about what, about what being a leader is all about. I am very proud to have Bob Gomkiewicz as a colleague. I'm vicariously thrilled uh, for him to receive this award today, uh, recognizing his extraordinary impact on this institution. Uh, please join me in congratulating Bob Gomkiewicz as our newest Washington Law Foundation Professor of Law. Professor Calandrillo, that was a lovely uh, introduction, and I, I only have to say it's a funny thought to wonder if anyone in this room of law faculty had ever typed their own name into Google. I'm sure, I'm sure they haven't. I'm sure they haven't. Um, Professor Gomelkiewicz, please join me. It is a great honor today to bestow the uh, University of Washington Foundation Professor of Law um, Medal uh, on you and to congratulate you on achieving this honor. I want to endorse really everything that Steve said. Uh, I think he did a wonderful job of explaining the kind of success that Professor Gomelkiewicz has enjoyed. And for me, as you all know, uh, it's important that our faculty do have a commitment to excellence, not only in scholarship, but also in teaching and also in service to this institution so that we're constantly making this law school even greater than it already is. And so it's really that combination of what you've achieved and the admiration that we have for you in making the transition from practice into the academy and all, all those fronts so um, very, very well. But I also want to note today that my recognition of you in this role is not just about what you've already achieved. It's about in my belief in the future. 
And this area of law and technology is one that this law school should be one of the world's leaders in. And I think we are, we have been very strong. We are getting stronger every day in that area. And it's a very, very uh, important commitment of our school to continue that trajectory of excellence. And it's my absolute com uh, belief that you will help us achieve that uh, as we move forward. So uh, Professor Gomelkiewicz, it's my honor to uh, bestow the UW uh, Foundation Professor of Law Award upon you today. Well, when Dean Testy told me about this professorship, I was very excited. And so I went and told my family and friends that I had received a professorship. And they could sense the excitement in my voice, but they said, what is it all about? <laughs> they were confused. What is it all about? Well, my family and friends, thank you for coming. Hopefully this ceremony will tell you a little bit about what it's all about. But let me just say simply what it's all about to me, and that is that it is the highest honor that I believe a, prof a professor can receive. And so I am deeply honored um, and very grateful to Dean Testy for honoring me with this award. Um, I'm particularly honored because, as Steve allud alluded to, I have taken you might say, the road less traveled to get here. Um, I've spent 15 years practicing law before I came here. Um, but it's because I came by a different path. I come here every day deeply committed to teaching both the deep theory and the deep practice of law. And so um, that's what keeps me going. That's how I want to be as a professor. I want that to be central to my teaching and scholarship at this law school. Um, and it resonates so well with, uh, with the mission that Dean Testy has set out for our law school, which is educating leaders for the global common good. I'd like to thank a few people before I get into my remarks. First, I'd like to thank Steve Calandrillo for that wonderful introduction. Um, Steve has been one of the people that I have tried to model myself after as a professor. Um, and in fact, not only that, I rely on Steve to be somebody who reviews my scholarship. And, and normally I give my scholarship to lots of people to read and it never comes back. Um, I just assume that people are deeply touched by it, um, have been deeply moved by it, and so they just, they just put it on their coffee table. But, but Steve, um, usually within a few days, returns a draft to me completely marked up with blue pen and if you know Steve, there are a lot of exclamation points um, at different points and things underlined. And so um, as I was thinking about my scholarship when Steve and I were talking about it, I think Steve has probably read nearly all 19 of those articles, uh, well, at least half of, the, of them. And I'm really grateful um, for him as a colleague, both for the example that he sets, but also how he's been personally helpful to me um, as a colleague. I would also like to thank another one of my colleagues and that is Toshiko Takanaka. Um, as Steve mentioned, I wouldn't be here but for Toshiko Takanaka. Uh, I received a phone call literally out of the blue one day where Toshiko first said, would you like to go to lunch to talk about an IPLM program? Yeah, a free lunch would be great. <laughs> then she called me back and said, would you go to lunch and discuss whether you would be the director of that IPLM program? <laughs> well, that sounds like an even more interesting lunch. But then a third phone call the day of the lunch. Would it be all right if the associate dean, Pat Cuzzler, came along to the lunch? Well, that would be fine too. Love to meet Pat. You know, and from that simple phone call, those simple three phone calls, um, started a process in which I was able to come here and join this faculty um, of a law school that I love so much. And my journey here um, as part of the IP program has been particularly rich because of some of the staff I work with every day, Signe Navy and Jennifer Snyder I see sitting back there, and Toshiku Takanaka, they have been the core group of people in IP that I've worked with since I've been here. 
and I'm grateful they're here today, and I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank them for being such amazing colleagues. Um, I would also like to thank the Washington Law Foundation. Uh, Kelly has already done that, Steve has already done that. I would like to do that as well. The contributions that they make to us faculty pay off in real dividends. They enable us to do more scholarship, to do better scholarship, and to work with students on that scholarship. So it really enables us to, to bring students into the scholarly process as well. And so I just want to say thanks again for that. Um, I want to thank my family who is here supporting me. And in fact, I have to confess that they also have to endure a ritual that I started. Um, whenever I publish an article at dinner that night, I read the introductory paragraph. <laughs> I do, I really do. And they endure that. Uh, maybe they even like that, but they endure that, and so I want to thank them for that. Um, I want to uh, thank, in particular, my wife, Andrea Larison, who's here. And many of you know that I met Andrea at this law school. Um, and in fact, I met Andrea on the Washington Law Review. And when I told the Washington Law Review students this, they said, Wow, we knew that the Washington Law Review was a great networking opportunity, but who knew that you could find a spouse there? And so I think that has been a transforming idea for some of those Law Review students. So thank you so much for coming and supporting me. Um, I'd also like to recognize my daughter, Kate Gummelkiewicz. Uh, she is the debater that Steve was referring to, and uh, she is a senior in high school at the Bear Creek School. And she is currently trying to decide whether to be a physician or a lawyer. Just do the right thing. Um, and I, I believe that Dean Testi said that she will be speaking to you at the reception following. Uh, my, my other daughter, Abby, is at, um, at St. Andrews University this year, so unfortunately she couldn't be here. She's pursuing a joint degree program at College of William and Mary in St. Andrews, so I just want to say hi to Abby if this is streaming over the internet. <laughs> okay, a few other thank yous before I talk about fostering the business of innovation. Um, as Steve mentioned, I come from lots of different communities, so I just want to say thanks to those different communities um, for people coming here and supporting me. I want to start off by acknowledging my colleagues from Scheidler, McBroom, and Gates, um, then Preston Gates and Ellis, and now k &L Gates. But I have to start with the name of the law firm when I started, and it was Scheidler, McBroom, and Gates. And the reason that I'm mentioning that is every day when I walk into this law school, I walk by a picture of Roger Scheidler, and I walk by a picture of Bill Gates. And now, it just doesn't get any better than that, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> in terms of you know, thinking about the people who have inspired you. And, and really, that was an amazing law firm. It's one of those law firms that still gets together every year um, and around the Christmas season and just enjoys one another because it was such a collegial place to be. And I really um, thought it was such a privilege to be a member of that law firm. And while I was at that law firm, I was particularly privileged to be one of those young associates that Bill Gates Sr. took an interest in and he had this tradition of taking associates out to the Rainier Club just to chat, right? just to get to know us and just to teach us what it was like to be a professional uh, to be a lawyer, and so um, I'm grateful to that firm. I'm grateful to Bill for, for being one of my mentors. I would also like to um, acknowledge my colleagues from Microsoft. Um, several of you are here, and you know, really, those 10 years at Microsoft were 20 of the best years of my life. <laughs> And I think you all know, I'm looking at Kevin Harang, um, and, and I think Kevin and Andy, you know what I mean when I say that. Um, again, working at Microsoft was a wonderful experience. It was an intense experience, but it's one of those experiences that um, was transformational for me. And, and I, I thank all those uh, friends and colleagues for being here today. Uh, I would also like to thank my former teachers at this law school. Um, it's kind of a mind-bending experience to become a faculty member at a place where you've been a student. 
And you just wonder what it's going to be like the first day when you become a colleague of Phil Troutman, Roy Prosterman, um, Dick Cummert, Ron Yorth. And when I came here, it was so natural. It was so comfortable. They just embraced me as a colleague. And I'm so grateful um, to them for doing that because um, they could have made me feel like a little child, right? <laughs> as law students sometimes feel when we're law students. And so I'm so grateful for those colleagues. And I especially want to hold up the name today of Dick Cummert, who passed away recently. But Dick Cummert was um, the law review advisor when I was a student here and was truly one of my um, best mentors and, and influential people in my life. While I'm on the subject of professors, I, I do have to recognize one other professor who's not from the University of Washington School of Law, but really is the person who inspired me to become um, an academic. And that's uh, Phil Nordquist, who is here from Pacific Lutheran University. Um, he was my favorite history professor. And really, I wanted to be a history professor like Professor Nordquist. But even though this is the road less traveled, that was a road I just was not even prepared to travel to become a PhD in history. Um, but I still am inspired, was inspired by Professor Nordquist. And I'm so grateful that he is here today with, um, with his wife, Helen. OK, we're almost done with the thank yous. And we can get to the talk. Right, But I just want to say uh, in conclusion that as I was thinking about all these people and how they have been influential to me, I was reminded of that great quote from Isaac Newton about how if we've seen further, it's because we have stood on the shoulders of giants. And um, I hope you don't get tired of that quote. I like that quote. I think it's a very inspirational quote. But as I was reflecting on it, um, and as I was reflecting on the mission of this law school, which is really to, to send us out to serve, um, I really thought that there's another variation of that quote that I would like to start today. And that's something like this. And that's, if I've served better, if I've served better, it's because I've stood shoulder to shoulder with giants. And giants like Bill Gates, giants like Roy Prosterman, Giants like Lauren Anderson, who's here today, who was a 20-year president at Pacific Lutheran University, and giants like Dick Cummert, who I wish was here today, uh, and who I remember as I talk. All right, speaking of talks, let's talk about the business of innovation. That's your cue, Len. Lenny is our technical guy, and he's the one who's making this all happen. Okay. Well, I think it's uh, best to start by saying that we live in an information economy, and it's really an economy that's no longer dominated by the production of hard goods, but it's really dominated by the creation of ideas and information. And when we look at that economy, we can see that intellectual property is really critical to fostering creativity and innovation in that innovation economy. We know this because US lawmakers have really been very focused on passing and amending intellectual property laws to ensure that we are fostering creativity and innovation. Um, lately, for example, you've seen an, an amendment to the patent law known as the American Invents Act. And you've seen multiple attempts to try to amend the copyright law to try to keep it up with the digital economy. It's also important to know that this focus on intellectual property law is not limited to the United States. Right, economic powerhouses such as Germany and Japan have put intellectual property at the center of their industrial policy. And recently, China has joined that club as China has become a net IP producing nation. Last summer, I had the privilege to travel to China with Professor Takanaka and some of my other colleagues to put on a week-long training session for the IP tribunal of the Chinese Supreme People's Court. And, and I got to see that transformation firsthand as I spent time with those Chinese judges. But I didn't have to go to China to, to see the international impact of intellectual property. All I have to do is walk around here in the halls of Gates Hall. We have IP lawyers from around the world studying here at the University School of Law. 
And I have come to believe, and I like to say, that the University of Washington School of Law has really become the gathering place for the next generation of leaders in intellectual property law. But despite this critical importance of intellectual property law in fostering innovation, there is more to the story. And so today, if I can borrow from the late broadcaster Paul Harvey, I want to give you the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is that creating intellectual property is great, but it's not very useful or very valuable unless you do something with it. Getting a patent feels good, but it's better if somebody can pay you to use that patent. Um, having a copyright in a song is great, but it's even better if you enable people to sing it and share it. And for those of you who like to write books, it's even better if you can write a book and then enable people to read the book. And the best legal tool for allowing people to do things with intellectual property is contract law. Contract law puts intellectual property into action. Intellectual property law is important, no question about it, but it's contract law, this subject that everyone L takes, and unfortunately I found every 2L and 3L forgets. <laughs> that is the hidden hero in fostering the business of innovation. Now using contracts with intellectual property is something that we call licensing, and licensing simply means giving somebody permission to do something with your intellectual property. When I was doing research on the history of intellectual property licensing when I was visiting in Oxford, I discovered that intellectual property licensing is as old as intellectual property itself. Um, intellectual property licensing is mentioned in the oldest intellectual property law that we know about, the 1474 Venetian Patent Act. So licensing is old, Right? But what is new and significant is that licensing has really become the predominant transaction model in this information economy. Okay, so why is that so? Why is that so? And that is so because licensing plays a critical role in two types of innovation, technological innovation and business model innovation. Technological innovation refers to the use of licenses to build inventive and creative products. Licensing enables the sharing and collaboration that people need to do to build these information products. Let's just take Microsoft Windows as an example. Microsoft did not write every line of code in Windows. Right? Microsoft Windows is written by hundreds of individuals and firms. And the legal tool that Microsoft uses to bring all of these contributions together is a license. Competitors to Windows, such as Linux-based operating systems, are built the same way. And so just as Bill Gates III did not write every line of code in Windows, Linus Torvalds did not write every line of code in Linux either. Um, licensing is the legal tool that both of them use to build their products um, with these third-party contributions. Licensing also plays uh, a critical role in the innovative business models that companies use to take their products to market. Companies distribute software these days in a multitude of ways, by download, by upload, by email, by bulletin board, by, by Facebook, by CD-ROM, by flash drive, by hard drive. And licenses on top of that also allow end users to do innovative things with the software they get. Licenses allow software companies to provide different packages of rights to end users at different price points. And so I know you hate mass market licenses, right? They annoy you, um, but you like the things that they enable. You like free mobile phone apps. You like cheap home and academic edition software. You like clip art that you can use for your presentations. You like the Android operating system. You like the power of shopping on Amazon.com, and you like sending Google Mail over the internet. And all these things are brought to you courtesy of end user licensing. All right, well that's a happy story. <laughs> but IP scholars have concerns, right? They have serious concerns. And one of their concerns is that intellectual property 
gives software companies too much control. Um, IP scholars take a darker, more skeptical view of licensing. And if you think that they're worried about intellectual property, they're really concerned about combining intellectual property with contracts because they are concerned that it gives intellectual property holders far too much control, that combination of IP plus contract. I wrote an article about uh, six years ago now, and I found over 100 articles criticizing the use of end-user licenses, right? And just a handful praising them, all of which were written by me. <laughs> The concern of the IP scholars is that IP holders are going to use contracts and IP to stifle innovation in small firms right, and reduce consumer choice and prices. So it's complicated, right? It really is complicated. Um, how do we uphold the value of contracts and at the same time maintain balance in intellectual property law? Right? The scholars have a point. Um, and it's fair to say what we're trying to do is get the best out of licensing, but not have the worst out of licensing, right? We want parties to be able to freely shape their transactions, to allocate risk, and to have certainty about what their contracts are, while at the same time, not unduly detracting from follow-on inventors um, and stifling creativity through too much control. So it's complicated. But fortunately, we have help, right? We have boundaries that try to keep this combination in check. The law has an array of tools to keep licenses within their productive boundaries. For example, we have this equitable doctrine called intellectual property misuse. We have antitrust law, which unfortunately my former employer found can be a very effective tool to keep abusive licensing practices in check. We have doctrines like unconscionability and construing contracts against the drafter. Um, we have all these tools, and I argued in my early scholarship that these boundaries would be sufficient to allow the software industry and software consumers to enjoy the benefits of licensing without the significant negative consequences. Well, I'm happy to say that despite the loud chorus of scholarly criticism, the courts have come out in the same place that I have. And so um, looking at all the good points and the bad points of licensing, courts starting with the Pro CD case in 1996 and coming up to this more recent case from the Ninth Circuit, the Werner case, have pretty much uphold mass market licensing at least as long as it doesn't go over the boundaries that I talked about before. So if you want to stand back and kind of look at the big picture, I think it's fair to say that in the 1990s, scholars and others really had this fear that dominant firms would use licensing to squeeze out innovative new firms. But now we have this interesting reality in 2000, which is that innovative new firms and actually some old firms are using licensing to unseat the firms of the 1990s. And now I want to turn to the best example of that because the best example of how licensing has rocked and shocked the established order in the software industry is something that we call open source licensing. Open source licensing is licensing for revolutionaries, right? Open source licensing is about licensing for revolutionaries. It uses licenses to give freedom to software users. It uses licensing to actually give away all of the exclusive rights of copyright. The most important open source software license was written by this fine gentleman here, Richard Stallman. Right? He wrote this license called the General Public License. He's the founder of the Free Software Foundation. He's a master programmer. He was a MacArthur genius. He's a firebrand. But actually, he's the most famous for being a drafter of software licenses, right? And he drafted this general public license to give away the exclusive rights of copyright, to reverse the copyright with a license that he called a copy left license. Very clever, right? Okay, so what do we get with open source? Right, let's drill down into that a little bit. I think the simplest way to, do, to summarize it is you get four freedoms. 
um, when you get open source software. You get the freedom to view the code in source code form. That's the form that programmers can actually work with. See, now you get a quick computer science lesson, right? View the source code, run the software for any purpose, modify the software in any way, and then distribute the software in those modifications. That's what an open source license gives you. Well, Richard Stallman's not the only one that loves licenses. Right? Bill Gates and Linus Torvalds love licenses too, as I already mentioned, right? So something good must be going on here. Okay, so let's spend a couple minutes talking about a couple of key open source licenses, right? Um, now, you've been persuaded so far that these open source licenses are great. Everybody likes free stuff, right? Everybody likes things that are open, but whenever you hear free, Everybody should be getting a little bit nervous. Everybody should be, be saying, we know there's no such thing as a free lunch. What's the catch, right? And well, the catch with open source licenses is this, that the open source programmers want something back in return, right? They're gonna give you the copy left, but they want something back in return. And there are two important types of give backs in open source licenses. And so I wanna talk about those two different kinds of give backs. One give back is attribution, which just simply means that if you use the programmer's code, they want you to give them credit, right? So I'm gonna call that particular give back an attribution license, right? A license that if I give you my software, you agree to give me credit for using that software, an attribution license. The other kind of license emphasizes the sharing of modifications to the software. So if you make a derivative of somebody's software, you must share those derivatives with everyone else forever, right? I'm gonna call this kind of license, with, with that kind of give back, a share alike license. And Richard Stallman's general public license is that kind of a share alike license. Okay, so Open source licenses is an interesting, but why am I talking to you about it today other than to give you general education? Well, let me conclude my talk by showing you how open source licensing actually provides an incredibly useful lens through which to look at difficult licensing law issues. Okay, open source, an open source licensing lens really keeps us honest as scholars, right? It forces us to both look at the value of contracts Right. But at the same time, value maintaining balance in intellectual property law. So let's use that lens. Okay, so we're going to use that open source lens to understand an important current issue in software licensing law. And the issue is this. When is a particular provision in a license agreement a contractual covenant, and when is it a license condition? So a covenant is a straight up promise. I promise to do X. A license condition grants rights but has a proviso. I grant you a license provided you do X. Okay, those of you who have been following me so far, you're about ready to take a mental break. I know it, right? You're about ready to take a mental break from now until the reception, right? <laughs> but let me give you three reasons to stay with me, right? To stay with me just for a few more minutes, okay? Don't take a mental break just yet. Here are three reasons to stay with me. First, as we probe and explore this covenant condition distinction, we get to illustrate three important things. Thing one, it shows us the power of contract to amplify the control that intellectual property law provides, which takes us to the outer boundary of acceptable licensing practices, right? So we are now on a licensing law thrill ride, right? <laughs> Is that enough to keep you awake? As if that wasn't enough. Number two, probing this distinction provides an excellent demonstration of how the deep knowledge of legal doctrine is directly relevant and incredibly useful in the actual practice of law, okay? And if that wasn't enough, three, the open source lens can help us analyze and solve challenging licensing law issues. And so I'm gonna help you see all of that, hopefully in five or 10 minutes. 
Okay, so what about this distinction between covenants and conditions? Well, it's a, this covenant condition distinction is a distinction with a big difference, a huge difference, because it affects the remedies that a license, license or can get for the breach of license. If you just breach a contract, the normal measure of damages is monetary damages. But if you breach a license condition, you don't just have a breach of contract, you have an infringement of copyright law, which opens up an incredibly robust set of remedies, right? most important of which is injunctive relief. Right? Injunctive relief is an incredibly powerful remedy, and people who have licenses would love to be able to take advantage of that remedy. And in the context of open source licenses, injunctive relief is actually the only remedy that matters. Right? It's the only remedy that matters because most of the time, these licenses, no money is exchanged in an open source license. Open source licensing depends upon the ability to enforce that attribution requirement or that share-alike requirement with injunctive relief. In other words, open source licenses absolutely depend upon the ability to create a license condition enforceable by injunctive relief. All right, I didn't just make that up. There are several recent cases that start to get into this issue, beginning with this case in 2008 from the Federal Circuit, Jacobson versus Katzer, which was the first case to really enforce open source licenses. It mentioned the condition covenant issue, but it didn't take it head on. But just a couple of years ago in the Ninth Circuit, the MDY Industries case did take on that issue head on. And so we're going to now look at that case. But before we do, I want to say that this covenant versus condition question is particularly challenging because of the power wielded by experienced license drafters. Right? So this is a tool that can be used by experienced license drafters, like the students in my intellectual property licensing class. I am giving them this power. Now, a skillful license drafter can turn almost any covenant into a license condition, as illustrated by this slide and all the slides that you're going to see from here on out. So let me just put it a different way, in a way that should raise a red flag for you. Right? This puts a lot of power in the hands of sophisticated parties who can hire expensive lawyers. Right? That should raise a red flag for you. Well, and in fact, it raised a red flag for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals right, in the MDY Industries case. In that case, Blizzard Entertainment's lawyers turned a requirement about playing its World of Warcraft's game by the rules. Right? In the license, it wanted the users of that game to agree to play by the rules. And it did it by turning that, um, that condition into a license condition. Right? You may play the game, provided you play by the rules. Well, in dicta, the court also thought about whether you could turn the payment of money into a license condition. It discussed that question because that question comes up in lots of license agreements. In other words, you may copy the game provided you pay $100 per copy. I've turned what could just be a promise to pay $100 into a license condition. Any student in my class could do this. Well, now let's move to the open source context. Right? And Jacobson versus Katzer, as I mentioned, raised this issue but did not address the issue. And the issue is, can attribution be a condition? In other words, you may copy the software provided you put my copyright notice on all copies. Right? Does that work? And then while we're at it, we might as well think about whether you can turn share-alike into, into a condition as well. Right? We have to ask that question. You may modify the software provided you always share your modifications with everybody. Okay, hang in there with two more slides. So the MDY test, or the MDY court, wanted to create a boundary right, that, would, that would balance the great things about contract with keeping IP in check and in balance. 
And so the way it decided to do that was by creating a test, right? A test for when you can decide when something is a condition and when something is a covenant, right? It, and the reason I'm sympathetic to that approach is the first time I tried to write an article on the subject, that's exactly what I thought I was going to create. And then I realized it's impossible to do it, right? But I'm just a scholar, they're the courts, they get to do it, so now it's the law. And so, but let's work through these examples and see how this test really works. So let's first start with this, well, in the test, by the way, the way that the district court, the trial court, is supposed to decide whether something is a covenant or a condition is they're supposed to see how much grounding it has in copyright and whether there's a nexus with copyright, right? Clear? Okay, so just like we do in class, let's run through four hypotheticals, right? Let's use that fair play um, condition from the MDY case. And I put that in red because there is no grounding in copyright, right? There is no grounding in copyright just to tell somebody to follow the rules of the game. And the MDY court said that can't be a license condition. That's just a covenant. In other words, you can't get an injunction for violating that term of the agreement. So that's in red. As I said, the court also talked about royalties and dicta. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, there is no grounding in copyright for the payment of money. Is that what you're thinking? That's what I was thinking. But you know what? The Ninth Circuit said, well, because the payment of money is so prevalent in licenses, we're going to create a special exception. So you can make the payment of royalties into a condition. In other words, you can make it a term enforceable by injunctive relief. So I put that in green, right? You can turn that into a uh, condition if you're clever enough to do so. Okay, well now let's think about attribution, right? Let's think about those open source licenses. What about attribution? Well, attribution is not one of the exclusive rights of a copyright holder, at least not in this country. Attribution is what copyright scholars call a moral right. Um, but the U.S. doesn't recognize moral rights, well, except in the only limited way. So in France, France recognizes moral rights, right? But the U.S. doesn't really recognize moral rights. So I put this condition in the gray area, right? It's moderately related to copyright, but not exactly. And what about share alike? Right? The thing that really makes Richard Stallman's license work, what about that? Well, a promise to share is just a promise to do something, right? with no particular grounding in copyright. Now, notice, copyright students, that it is a great example of a non-monetary type of consideration. Right? And in fact, from my experience in the software industry, many, many licenses, I might even say most licenses, are licenses where money is not exchanged, where people are trading promises to do different things. Um, and so one of the interesting things about this MDY test is that it allows monetary consideration to become a condition, but it doesn't allow non-monetary consideration to act as a condition. So I unfortunately had to put share like in the red category. Okay, last slide. The problem with the MDY approach is it asks trial courts to apply an amorphous test. Um, and I think that the trial courts, the district courts, are going to find this test difficult and frustrating to apply. And the reason I know this is I've watched them try to apply different tests in patent law, like construing claims and trying to figure out things about novelty. Right? And one of the big complaints you hear from trial courts, district courts, is how difficult it is to draw those lines, and they are so frustrated because they're constantly overturned by the federal circuit. Right? So I know that district courts find these kinds of tests very frustrating to apply. Um, but I have a better idea. I think there's a different approach that we can take. And I think that the better approach is to focus on remedies. Right? Remedies, that class in law school that none of you ever took. <laughs> but it turns out it's just as important as contract law, right? Um, and here's the big point, that the only time that the covenant 
and condition distinction really matters is when you ask for injunctive relief. Right? That's where the rubber meets the road. Otherwise, it's just an interesting academic discussion. But the only time it really matters to the parties is when somebody is seeking injunctive relief. And that's really helpful to, for us in understanding what to do here because as much as trial courts are not particularly good at applying amorphous tests, they are good at looking at all the facts and circumstances by right, including grounding in copyright and nexus, but not just grounding in copyright and nexus, all the other factors that would go in to a license. They're very good at looking at those totality of the circumstances and using their wise judgment, right, and deciding whether to grant injunctive relief or not. So a multi-factor remedies-based approach really plays into the strengths of trial courts and allows them to better respect freedom and, freedom and certainty of contract, and as well as respecting other important values in copyright law, such as authorial control. Okay, last thing. So this diagram, I think, in this diagram, I'm trying to show a trial court how they would weigh those various factors. And as this chart illustrates, a remedies approach, I think, works better in two important scenarios, right? Scenario number one, is commercial licenses where two sophisticated parties have decided to draft a license that requires a condition, right? And those sophisticated parties fully know and fully intend for that contract to be enforced with injunctions. And so this approach allows that contract to be enforced. But um, I think more interesting, and going back to my point about looking at things through the open source lens, is that with this approach, both attribution and share alike licenses, I think would be enforced. Because the way the contract is drafted indicates a condition. There's at least a moderate nexus to copyright law in the attribution license. And most importantly, these open source licenses promote copyright goals of distribution of works and ideas. All right, well thanks for allowing me to explore um, these ideas about how we can foster the business of innovation by using contracts and remedies. I want to thank Professor Gamal Kaiwit so much for that lecture. It's a, it's a wonderful example. And um, you know, as a contracts teacher myself, of course, it all does come back to contract law. Uh, but it's also a particularly good example, I think, that one of the challenges of contract law is it always applies both in the consumer context and also in the very sophisticated commercial context. And this is a wonderful example of where that sometimes that conflict uh, ensues from that uh, dichotomy. Um, I want to ask you to please join me again in recognizing Bob as the UW Foundation Professor of Law today. Congratulations, Bob. And we look very much forward to your continued leadership in the area of law and technology here. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And so many of you in this room today have been such an important part of uh, our history and our strength in this area. And I also invite you to continue to be with us to be a part of our exciting future in that regard too. We have a reception down the hall in the Perkins Cooey Room. It's in room 115. And you just exit out this room to the left and take the long hall down to your right, and you'll see a reception there where you can visit further with Professor Gommel Kiewitz and also enjoy each other's company. So have a very good evening, and thank you for being here.